Welcome to Dear Sandy. I'm Sandy Galef, a member of the New York State Assembly representing parts of Northern Westchester and parts of Putnam County. And today we're going to be talking about a very important issue, consumer beware. Uh, it's just incredible the number of phone calls and emails that we get or people that stop me in the supermarket and tell me about uh, the scam that, that has been going on, the newest scam. And we all need to protect ourselves and we need to know what's going on out there. And uh, for people that don't want to protect us and take advantage of our money or our goodwill or our health or whatever. And so I have as my wonderful guest, Gary Brown, who's been on my show many times. And Gary, I guess you're the statewide elder abuse coordinator, yep. as well as the assistant attorney general in charge of the New York State Office um, of the Attorney General in Westchester. Correct. That's a very long title. It is. It's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> and it doesn't get shortened. Mm. And you probably have more and more responsibilities. Um, it is you know, I, I've invited you here because even if we talk about these issues of consumer fraud um, and and how to protect ourselves, it it seems like we have to do it all the time. It it is it changing? Do the the systems change on us yeah. every month, every week? Sandy, we do need to keep talking about it. First of all, to remind ourselves of it because what the scammers try to do is to trigger an emotional response. And that can happen very quickly. So you need to be constantly reminded they're going to try to push your emotional buttons. Don't let them do it. But also the trends change and the methods change, and we need to keep up with that as well. Mm -hmm. So we have, I mean, we have all these phones. We've, we have cell phones. We have our home phones. Uh, we have our computers. Um, I guess those are the vehicles. Did I leave something out, how people get in touch with us? Occasionally we get door-to-door -door complaints, but nowadays mm -hmm. the internet is a scammer's dream. Uh, they can make low-cost phone calls to anywhere in the world. They can spoof the number so that the number you see is not really the number that called you. So if you report the call, the government has a very mm -hmm. hard time tracking it down. It's estimated that 50% of all cell phone calls in the United States this year in 2019 will be robocalls or scam calls. That's the extent of the problem. And when I go wow. speak to the public and I meet a group and I'll ask them, how many of you got this call or that one? The hands go up. Right. Everyone's getting these calls. So I can't believe it. So with your, with your cell, you were saying the cell phone that about 50% come into robocalls or scam calls, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Many of the robocalls, I feel like, start out with something like, you know, you're, you don't have a credit problem, but we see that there's a credit problem and you need to yeah. do something. I don't know what that falls into. Well, the most common phone scam we've ever seen in the United States is the so-called IRS scam, the Internal Revenue Service scam, where the caller mm -hmm. says he's an IRS agent, you owe money, and if you don't pay us today, we're going to come and arrest you. Now, there are aspects of this call that don't make sense. For starters, the IRS doesn't call you on the phone when you owe money. They send you a letter. Mm -hmm. Number two, they don't threaten you with immediate arrest. And number three, they don't tell you to pay your taxes by going to a pharmacy, buying a gift card, and calling back with a serial number, which is what the scammers mm -hmm. are now mm -hmm. doing. So there are aspects of it that don't make sense. But if you don't know it's a scam, you're going to be afraid when you get this call. You're going to be panicked. Mm -hmm. And since we're all kind of afraid of the IRS anyway, I think deep down, uh, mm -hmm. this scam plays into that fear. And I actually had somebody, we were talking about this in the office the other day, and um, somebody volunteers in my office, she said she knew somebody that had just been scammed that way yeah. and ended up giving $10,000. Um, and, and I don't know whether that was all in gift cards or whatever else, but I guess the fear of the IRS and doing something wrong yeah. just inspired somebody to hand over that much money? It does. It's estimated this call works between about 1 in 50 to 1 in 100 calls. So most people don't fall for it. But when you multiply mm -hmm. that 1 in 50 times the millions of calls that they're making, it translates into many, many victims who are losing a lot of money. $10,000 is kind of on the high end for that scam. It's usually a lower amount. I think the scammers figure if they ask for too much, you're going to get suspicious. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a terrible scam, and many people have fallen for it. What's happened lately is that the scammers are using, as I mentioned, Sandy, this method of the gift cards. Up until a couple of years ago, they would tell you to go to a bank or to a Western Union shop and wire the money. But the banks and Western Unions have now trained their tellers so that if you go in and you say, the IRS called me, I'm in panic, they're going to warn you it's a scam. So now what they do is they tell you to go to a chain pharmacy or a, a big box store, buy some gift cards, and call them back with a serial number. That allows the money to be transferred without a trace from your card to theirs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the likelihood that the cashier at your pharmacy is going to warn you about this is very slim.
Right. But if somebody, if you did go to um, a pharmacy and you were buying a whole lot of gift cards, are people triggered now? I mean, the staff, maybe not. You have a lot of young people that are working uh, behind the desk and so on. Do, do you think that they do ask the question? I think increasingly they are, and I know more and more retailers are training their cashiers because the retailers, on the one hand, like the money they make off mm -hmm. the sale of the gift cards, but they don't want to be the middleman in a fraud. Mm -hmm. So they are training their cashiers. Uh, a colleague of mine at work had the experience of being at Walgreens lately. She was online. The gentleman in front of her tried to buy $8,000 worth of gift cards. She practically tackled him and oh said, why goodness. are you doing this? And it turned out he had gotten one of these scam calls. Mm -hmm. But the cashier, would he was about to jump in and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But still, that's the method they're using nowadays is the gift card. So basically, the, the warning now is if somebody asks you f to go get a gift card, say no and no, it's, it, there's no value. I mean, nobody's going to do that. No. That's a in, a in, good legal person. In fact, Sandy, the Federal Trade Commission made it illegal to ask for payment over the phone by gift card, debit card, or to wire the money. So somebody says, oh, as soon as somebody okay. says to you, buy a gift card and call me back, you know they're a scammer, right. hang up the phone. Right, right. It's a real red flag. So what motivates, I mean, what, are there different age groups that, that fall for more of these scams than other age groups? Um, you know, I had always thought that older adults were the most vulnerable, but some recent studies have shown that millennials, on a statistical basis, are actually more vulnerable. Oh, okay. They don't use the phone very much right. to make phone calls. They're more into the texting and the emailing uh -huh. and the messaging. So when they do get a call, they're not used to being on the phone, and they're almost, in a way, more susceptible uh, to these calls. But older adults are always a target, especially if you're home, you tend to answer the phone, you have a landline. Mm -hmm, Historically, mm -hmm. we think of the phone as our friend, our generation. The phone is no longer our friend, but the older we are, we tend to think of it in those mm -hmm. terms. Because I do know when I am home, I, there were a lot of calls that come through. And now on my phone, you know, I, I do know the numbers, but as you said before, sometimes you think it's a local call and you pick it up and it is not. Well, what they're doing is called neighbor spoofing. More and more of us are not answering the phone unless we recognize the number, which I think is the best defense nowadays. You mm -hmm. don't recognize mm -hmm. the number, don't answer the phone. But they're trying to trick us into answering by spoofing a number that's in our area code and exchange with four other digits than our mm -hmm, own number. Mm -hmm. And they're hoping we're going to think it's a local business, it's a neighbor, it's somebody we know, and we're going to answer the phone on that basis. So the moral of the story is don't answer the phone unless you recognize the entire number. Now, I had the experience last year of my cell phone ringing, and I looked, and the number was my own cell phone number. And I thought, that's oh, weird. Oh. You know, can you butt dial yourself? Uh -huh. I didn't know what I had done. So I picked up the phone, and it was a bank in Georgia trying to sell me a credit card. They had spoofed my own number to get me to answer out of curiosity. So you can't call yeah. yourself. If you see your own number appear, don't answer it. If you don't recognize the number, don't answer it. Yeah, that's so interesting. I came home last night from work, and I had three calls from Sandra Argaloff on, on my phone when I started, mm -hmm. and nobody was there. I bet. I, I bet somebody used my name on that. Yeah, they're trying yeah. to spoof you. The caller yeah. ID spoofing has made it really hard to track these people down because the number you see, the number you would report to the mm -hmm. government, is not really the number that called you in the first place. So it's made enforcement very, very difficult. Now, not answering the phone is not a perfect solution. A few months ago, my cell phone rang. I didn't recognize the number. I proudly didn't answer the phone. A few minutes later, I see there's a voice message, and it was the attorney general calling me urgently about a case. <laughs> so I called her right back. She, she laughed, and she understood. So it's not a perfect system, but for the moment, it's really the best one right, we've got. Right, right. Just not answer. Okay, let's talk about um, the Social Security, because uh, I had a phone call. I'm, I'm driving to work today, mm -hmm. and I had a phone call fr uh, from New Hampshire, and my sister lives in New Hampshire, so I said yes shouldn't have said yes, but anyway, I did. And it was Social Security, but I was glad actually that I did because I knew we were gonna be talking about yeah. the Social Security one. The timing. And you know, it just said, you, your Social Security number has been compromised and call us right away, um, there's a problem here and so on. So is that, is that a newer one or has that been around for a while? It's a newer one because as more and more people have become aware of the IRS scam and know not to fall for it, they're now, the mm -hmm. imposters are now claiming they're from a different government agency, the Social Security Administration. And they either say that your Social Security number has been compromised or that if you don't pay a fee, your, your benefits will stop. There's a couple mm -hmm. of different variations on it, but I think what they're basically doing is tweaking the scam a little bit away from the IRS toward another government agency 
uh, the Social Security Administration. So wow. I got a call recently from someone who said, Gary, you should be able to catch these guys this time. Because he said to me, I have the number that appeared on my caller ID right. when they called. They mm -hmm. gave me a street address in El Paso, Texas, and they also gave me a callback number. So can't you go to Texas and bust them? Well, the number he <laughs> saw on his caller ID was a spoof number. It wasn't really the number uh -huh. they called him. Right. The address in El Paso was a fictitious address, and the callback number they gave him was the Federal <laughs> Drug Enforcement Administration. <laughs> but the car okay. claimed it was the Social Security Right, scam. right. So is there a way to find, is anybody ever found that's doing these you kinds know, of things? You know, occasionally there's a bust. These calls tend to originate overseas. In 2016, mm -hmm. there was a major bust of an IRS scam ring making calls out of Mumbai, India. I think 370 people were arrested. No money was recovered, however. It's very difficult to trace these calls. They're made from foreign countries. So right now, our best defense is don't answer the phone if you don't recognize mm -hmm. the number. Mm -hmm. If you do answer the phone and someone starts asking for personal information, we urge you to think of the phone as a one-way street. You don't give out personal information unless you dial the number you know to be right. the correct number of your bank, your credit card company, a government agency. If mm -hmm. somebody calls mm -hmm. you and wants that info, hang up. Mm -hmm. So for example, people will say that we all get the call from the credit card company and says, looks like there are some unauthorized charges on your right. account. Right. Hang yes. up, get out your credit card, look up the toll-free number and dial that number. Mm -hmm. If it mm -hmm. turns out they really were calling you in the first place, no harm, no foul. You made an extra phone call. But if when you call the credit card company and they say it wasn't us, it means that first mm -hmm, caller mm -hmm. was a scammer. Right. I remember um, I, uh, calling, I guess it was a bank I called just to be sure because I'd gotten something, uh, you know, on my, my email from a bank. And so I just went down to my local branch and said, what's going on yep. here? And they told me, oh, you know, this is, you know, they, they were trying to get into your head somehow yeah, with this yeah. banking issue. Yeah. So, so it's um, all about emotions. And a lot of mm -hmm. times, Henny, as I'm giving a presentation to a group of older adults, I can tell from the look on their faces that they're thinking, why is he wasting our time with this stuff? Anyone who would fall for one of these scams is stupid, and I'm not stupid, so what do I have to worry about? <laughs> but it's really not about intelligence at all. It's about emotions. Right. If they can push that emotional button, you're more easily manipulated. And the story I like to tell just to demonstrate that it's not about intelligence is the biggest con artist in the history of our country was Bernie Madoff. He stole over $50 billion. Mm -hmm and he stole it from some of the richest, smartest, most sophisticated investors in the world. So if those people right. could fall for a Ponzi scheme, it's, hard, it's not hard to believe that any of us could fall for the right call if the caller pushes the right emotional right. button. Madoff pushed the greed button. Greed mm -hmm, is a powerful mm -hmm. emotion, but so mm -hmm, is fear, mm -hmm. so are love, and other emotions mm -hmm. as well. Well, I, 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 whether I'm smart or not, I don't know, but I sit in front of my computer, and I don't always know how everything works. Yeah. And I'm sitting there one night, having a lot to do, and I have this big red screen that comes up on my computer. Mm -hmm. And it has a number in the middle, call this number. So not knowing what to do, how to get rid of this red screen, I learned later on I just should turn off the computer. Yeah. <laughs> it would probably go away. But I called the number, and that started that whole process of somebody in some other country helping me with a, with the tech but i've been helped before by people legitimately when i've right. called that are from other countries we must have people that that really do a lot of the uh internet uh activity that you know indians and so on but so that didn't you know concern me so much but i realized i was starting to get into this whole thing let us take over your numbers yeah. and so on um and um fortunately the american express um, called me because I had allowed them to charge me a certain amount of money to get this system back in right. place, which was the wrong thing to do. Yep. I realized that. And, but, but I was just, the emotions were there. How am I going to deal with this, with a computer that's not working? It's 10 o'clock at night. Yep. Who am I going to call? And, uh, and then when I went to the office the next day, I said, you know, some people in the office said, just turn off your computer and that red yeah. screen would go away. So. The high tech is, is really difficult for many people. Yeah, this is called the tech support scam. It's a very common one. In fact, it's one of the fastest growing phone scams and computer scams in the country. You either get a phone call from someone says, your computer's not working right or it's broken, give me remote access and I'll fix mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. or you see a pop-up screen that has a phone number mm -hmm. and That's it's the I same say. thing. Right. They then want, instruct you to give them remote access to your computer and if you do that, they then lock it. They put ransomware on the computer and the only way you can get it unlocked is to give them a credit card number. And what's interesting about this, Sandy, is that it's estimated that this tech support scam works one in six phone calls. 
whereas oh, the IRS scam remember. works between 1 in 50 and 1 in 100. So this oh. is a scam that works because we all use right. computers and rely on them, but most of us don't know how they work and how they mm -hmm. operate. Mm -hmm. And the thought of somebody coming out of the blue and offering to fix it for you and make it work faster mm -hmm. is very mm -hmm. appealing. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. So you get, do you get a lot of calls about that in the office or? We do. Every week we get calls from people who, who either are reporting one of these scams or fell victim to one of these scams. Mm -hmm. The bad mm -hmm. news is if you fall victim to one of these scams, the likelihood of us finding the bad guy and getting your money back is very slim. But these are mm -hmm. preventable scams if people know about them, which is why it's so important to have the kind of conversation we're having right mm -hmm. now. And I, I was so, I was so glad that I had done something with American Express because they contacted me right away. Um, I don't know whether other, I, I'm sure that a lot of your credit card companies, I, I don't know that they're watching for those kinds of things that are happening. Uh, but that certainly, they did help. My own experience with American Express is that they do tr do a very good job of tracking it. But I've also had Master and Visa, a Mastercard mm -hmm, and a Visa mm -hmm. card give me the same kind of alerts. Right. Right, which is great because they'll alert you because they've seen enough of it come through and then they end up having to, to pay, I guess. In and you know, some we're instances. only responsible if we report the deception the, the, uh, to American Express and one of the credit card companies within 60 days. Our liability is capped at 50 bucks mm -hmm. and they don't even make you usually pay the $50. Mm -hmm. But collectively, mm -hmm. we're all paying for the amounts above that because those costs are being passed along to all of us as consumers. Right, that's true. So, okay. Um, I know that. There's another, I, I, th I just find this so interesting. Um, everyone's desire to be loved and admired. Yeah. So you have a romance scam. Um, One of the fastest growing scams out there. Well, uh, a lot of older adults are now going on sites, uh, social media sites where you can meet other people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there are predators out there waiting for an older adult to post a profile. They then make contact. They engage in weeks or even months of lovey-dovey exchange of text messages and mm -hmm. uh, emails. There's always a reason why they can't come see you because they're in another country or they live in California or they've had a medical procedure. Mm -hmm. And then after mm -hmm. a period of grooming comes the ask. I need money. I have a medical bill I can't pay. I need to borrow some money. Can you give me some money? And oftentimes mm -hmm. the victim will go along with that. I'm aware of a case in Peekskill where a woman gave up her entire life savings uh, to someone who had contacted her oh, pulling the romance scam. Right. And when the woman's daughter tried to intervene, uh -huh. the mother got furiously angry and said, mm -hmm. I finally am finding some love in my life, and you're uh -huh. trying to put the kibosh on that, you're trying to ruin that. The daughter really couldn't intervene. There was nothing she can do. What's right. interesting right. about the romance scam is if someone calls the AG's office and says, someone called me and says they're an IRS agent and I owe money, is that a scam? And we tell them, yeah, it's a scam. They're happy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when you try to tell someone that they're being victimized by the romance scam, they don't want to uh -huh. hear it. You're telling them what they don't want to know, what they don't want to believe. And it can be very, very yeah. difficult to convince people that it really is a scam. Now, so have these people gone on an internet site themselves and reached out or somebody's reached out to them? They look for a profile of an older adult who's posted themselves mm -hmm, online. Mm -hmm, they post mm -hmm. a bogus, a fake profile, and then they make okay. contact on that basis. And right. the psychology is, su is such that I think it's very important if you know an, old, an older adult who's going to go on one of these uh, websites, talk to them about this beforehand. Because once they start having the lovey-dovey exchange of emails and text messages, right. it's very hard to convince them it's a fraud. But hopefully if you told them about the possibility of fraud mm -hmm. ahead of time, they'd be more mm -hmm. easily convinced mm -hmm. if it does happen. Right. So how long does it take for the, the person committing the fraud to start to ask for the money? Does that happen fairly quickly? It usually, no, it usually takes a few weeks, maybe eight weeks, three months, right. something in that oh, range. Okay. They want to build up that level of trust because they know mm -hmm. once they can mm -hmm. do that, the person will keep sending money. Mm -hmm. So they send the first thousand dollars because I need this and then it's another another and on one and, on. and how do they keep convincing the person that I can't come and visit you they've got a story <laughs> medical procedure business uh, uh, emergency there's always a story and people so much want to believe they've met someone who loves them that they'll sometimes right. go along with that, that the Federal Trade Commission estimated that in 2018 last year there were 21,000 victims of romance scams in the United States who lost over $100 million. And people over the age of 70, the average loss was $10,000 per victim. And bear in mind, oh, Sandy, that that $21,000 figure is just the tip of the iceberg right. because most victims don't want to tell anyone. They don't want to report it to government. They don't want to right. admit it. So that's just a, a small fraction of the real right. number of victims. I know when I've had um, my senior forums, and I just remember one who was uh, had by, he'd had a co-op arrangement in Florida, whatever, and he, he actually got up and he said, I'm so embarrassed to talk about the fact that um, 
I was conned into yeah. buying a share of, of something which was not even a yeah. real thing. Yeah. Uh, embarrassment is part of it, shame, humiliation. Sometimes it's denial. People just don't want to mm -hmm. believe they're being victimized. But I think there's another thing that I've learned, Sandy. I gave a presentation a couple of years ago up in New Paltz, and a woman came up to me afterwards from the audience. She had fallen victim to the grandparent scam, where the caller mm -hmm, pretends mm -hmm, to be your grandson, mm -hmm. says he's been arrested, mm -hmm, needs mm -hmm. money, she sent the money. And she started thanking me, and I couldn't understand why. And she said to me, you're the first person I've ever told, and it feels so good to get it off your chest. Oh, so okay. I said, really? You didn't tell your adult children? No. You didn't tell your grandson? No. Why not? She said, because if they knew I fell for this scam, they think I'm losing it. It's time to take uh -oh. over my finances, <laughs> put me in assisted living or a nursing home. She said, I would right. never tell them. I would uh -huh. rather suffer the, the loss of money in silence than risk right. the loss of self-control that I fear would happen if I told anybody. But imagine how terrible it must feel to be a victim of a crime mm -hmm. and not feel mm -hmm. you can tell someone. If someone steals your car, you mm -hmm. call the police, right? If someone right. burglarizes your house, you call the police. Right. But if you fall victim to one of these scams, people are very reluctant to report it. Very interesting. That first, I didn't have the grandparent scam, but I, I did have, um, I, I guess I must have gotten an email um, about a friend of mine ah. who was stuck in London uh, all of her, all of her pocketbook was taken and so on. Could I send some money and help yeah. her? So, um, you know, I fell for it, but my response was, since I'm in government, I said to the email, uh, no, thinking that this was my friend, um, you know, just call Nita Lowy's office, here's her number, because right. she, she's a federal uh, legislator and she can help you with the embassy in, in London. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure the person the other yeah. end said, this woman is, must be crazy, but uh, in my response. But I was totally, then I, then I called my friend and to find out, are she you wasn't okay? In and she wasn't in London right. and she said, you know what, somebody stole all my emails. Yeah. And so. Someone hacked into her email account mm -hmm. and then sent mm -hmm. an email in her name to right. all the people in the address book saying I've been mugged or whatever it was right. in London and I need money. Um, so it sho first of all, the first thing she needed to do was to change her password to get which the scammer did. out. Which she did, yes. But um, it shows that maybe her password had been a, a vulnerable one, a soft one in the first place. So one of the most important things we need to do nowadays is to figure out how can we come up with a strong password that we can remember and no one else can figure right. out. And the problem that uh, I think the mistake some of us make is we choose a word that is easy to remember but too easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. So if your password mm -hmm. is your grandchild's name, your street mm -hmm. address, your date of birth, anything someone could Google about you, that's a weak password. You want to come mm -hmm. up with another mm -hmm. one. So one of the suggestions we have is to think of a song, a poem, a figure of speech you'll never forget and make an acronym out of the first word of each, uh, first letter of each word. So for example, the Gettysburg Address began four score and seven years ago. Okay. So if you made right. an acronym, F-S-A-S-Y-A, -S and right. maybe added a number four and seven since they're the numbers from the figure of speech from the speech, right. you'll be able to remember it, you'll be able to recreate it even if you can't remember F-S-A-S-Y-A. So my mom, her password mm -hmm. for her Gmail account is the first letter of each of the famous lines from Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question, and mm -hmm. then there's a mm -hmm. number. And if I say, Mom, what's your password? She can't spit it out off the tip of her tongue, mm -hmm. but when she has her iPad in front of her, she can right. tap it out and it works right. for her. So what happens, do we use the same password a lot of different places? Is that one of no, our problems that's too? that's a vulnerability, because if your password in one account gets hacked, then they're all gonna get hacked. Right. But on the other hand, they don't have to be completely different. You could use the same beginning and then, and then have different numbers at the end mm -hmm. or different mm -hmm. symbols at the end or different capitalizations. I got a very clever tip from a guy. You know, there are these password apps that you can store your passwords in. But a guy came up to me after a speech a few years ago and he said, I write them all on an index card. And I have mm -hmm. it in the drawer of my desk. And I said, well, what if a burglar stole the index card? They'd have all your passwords. He goes, no. The first five letters of each password are dummy letters. The password begins on the sixth digit. Ah, but no one who stole that index card would have any way know. of knowing that. So he felt very secure <laughs> about having them all written down very conveniently, but in such right. a way that no one who stole the card could figure out what his password was. That were. sounds like a really good plan. Yeah, it's clever. <laughs> because people do say, I, you know, I, where, do you, where do you store all these different yeah. um, passwords for all these different different. I mean, there are apps you can store your passwords in. I think it's only a matter of time until one of them gets hacked and everybody's mm -hmm, password mm -hmm. gets divulged anyway. But that index card idea with a bunch of dummy digits at the beginning is kind of a mm -hmm, clever one. Mm -hmm. Right, that's great. So um, it, it's, uh, we, we just keep coming up with more, I mean, the fraud people just keep coming up with a new, new problem for yep. us. Do you know what they're gonna be thinking about next? Are well, you good at that? It's about <laughs> figuring out what emotional button they can push. And so one of mm -hmm. the relatively newer scams is the caller says he's from your local utility 
and you're behind in your bill, oh, okay. and we're going to cut off your electricity at 5 o'clock today if you don't go buy gift cards and call back with a that serial number. That seems kind of immediate. So uh, I learned how powerful the emotional button can be when my mother called me last August, sounding absolutely mm -hmm. hysterical, saying, I've never heard my mom sound like this. Gary, Con Ed called, and they're about to turn off the electricity. I can't live without air conditioning. It's 95 degrees out. So I said, Mom, it's a scam. Don't worry. She said, no, it's not a scam. Mm -hmm. She was hysterical. They gave me a callback number, and I called them back, and they confirmed. So I said, Mom, you just called the scammers back, and they confirmed. Right. Don't worry right. about it. It's a scam. And then she, she calmed down, and she realized. But she admitted to me that when she called, she was on her way to the pharmacy to mm -hmm. go buy mm -hmm. the gift cards, as the caller had instructed her to do. If I, had, mm -hmm. I was at work that day, if I had been unable to take the call when I did, she probably would have been she evicted. Probably they would asked have been. for 800 bucks. Wow. Wow. So we just, you know, in concluding, we, we know gift cards are just out. Just don't ever give a gift card other than when you go to buy a birthday present. Use it, use it present. to buy merchandise, but not over the, <laughs> uh, anything over the phone. Right. And um, so we really have to think about social security issues. We have to think about romance scams, the, the high tech, um, all of these different issues that, that come along the utility companies. Um, We're hoping there's a technological fix in the offing, that if the phone companies can manage to come up with a system that caller ID spoofing wouldn't work anymore, and you'd right. see the actual number that was calling you, it would put a real dent in the uh, armor of these scammers because we'd be able to find mm -hmm, out mm -hmm. where they are and who they are. But until then, we've got to be very careful. Best advice we can give is don't answer the phone if you don't recognize the number. There are mm -hmm, also mm -hmm. apps you can buy that will screen your calls, and you hear one ring and it cuts off and that means the company detected that as being a robocall or right. a spam call. That's great. So if somebody has a real problem, uh, do they call the Attorney General's office? Absolutely. The Office of Attorney General Letitia James. We're at 1-800-771-7755, and we'll do everything we can to help or explain. Right, right. And some of it is explaining because, as you, you explained to us, it's hard to track these people down. Yeah, it is. Right. Well, I just want to thank you, Gary, so much for being here. And, My pleasure. Um, reminding us of of uh, really watching customer beware. I mean that we really, as consumers and customers, we really, we have to be in charge of ourselves and just not let anybody take advantage of us. Well, prevention's the key, so I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you today. Right, so everybody talk to your family members and uh, convey the information that Gary has presented to us. And I wanna thank you for coming and I wanna thank the audience um, for, for watching the program. And again, if you have any concerns, please um, call the Attorney General's office, call my office at 914-941-1111. We really need to take care of ourselves and our families and our economics and our health and to be sure that um, we're not taken advantage of. That's the main thing. So thank you for watching. Have a good evening.